going to share a message that I've shared before, and I think it's been shared by uh, one or two others in the church, the parable of the sower. But we're going to look at it uh, from a slightly different context. So to begin with, if you turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, the parable of the sower is the prince of all parables. It is the parable on which all other parables stand. If you do not understand the parable of the sower, you cannot grasp any of the other parables of Jesus. This or these are not my words. These are the the Lord's words himself. Because he said to his disciples, and you can just write down the reference, in Mark's account of the same parable in Mark chapter 4 verse 13 Jesus says said to his disciples do you not understand this parable how then will you understand all the parables the parable of the sower is the single most important parable that Jesus ever spoke if it is the single most important parable if it is the chief of all parables is it not vital that each and every one of us fully understand and comprehend what Jesus was teaching this parable. All right, it's not a trick question. If it is the most important parable, then it is absolutely imperative that you and I understand it. So to frame the parable in its context, we go to chapter 12 and take up from verse 46. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Against the Hebraic culture, Jesus did not stop his teaching, did not pause to go out and greet his mother and brothers. But he continues doing what he was doing. He was about the father's business. And when one in the crowd said, your mother and brothers are here, Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are not my flesh and blood, but all who do the will of my father in heaven. This is the context in which Jesus is about to share the most important parable, the one on which every other parable and every other understanding of the kingdom of God is based. Because chapter 13, verse 1 says, on the same day. Which day? The day that he said that my brothers and my sisters and my mother are not my blood relatives, but are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day where he makes this statement, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. I need to share something with you, so I'm going to share it where you can all hear me. I will go to the sea where all can pay attention. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables. Many of the parables, the parable of the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the treasure in the field, these parables were all spoken by the Lord on this day. But he begins with the first, the most important parable, the parable of the sower. Got that? Keep your place in Matthew chapter 13. Now we need to understand context. Jesus was going to be speaking to 
Jews who had understanding of the Old Testament. He's going to talk about a sower sowing seed onto ground. And he's going to speak about four types of soil. To us in the New Testament church who are mostly unfamiliar with the Old Testament, we don't understand the connection between this parable and how the Jews would have understood it. You want to know how they would have understood this parable? A bit of a background to it. <coughs> Keep your place in Matthew chapter 13 and go with me, if you would, to the prophet Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. Every time Jesus would teach by parable, he would draw from things that the Jews would have an understanding of. And the Jews understood about soil. They were at this point still a very agrar agrarian, Jonathan, the right way, agrarian, is that right? Culture, they farmed. And most of them were farmers, not like today where we're professionals because it was the Catholic Church that forbade the Jews to have any profession. So we became bankers, which was considered the most mean, most despised occupation. So we became bankers, and yes, we're rich. <laughs> and that's thanks to the Catholic Church. Well, they are rich. Some of us became pastors, and we remain poor. In Jeremiah chapter 4, the context here, the Lord is calling on Israel to repent. And he says in verse 1, If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you'll put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your hearts. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn so that no one can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. God, by the prophet Jeremiah, speaks to the, the men of Jerusalem and Judah and says, Break up the fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. What is fallow ground? For those of us who are not farmers. That's right. Fallow ground is ground that has not been sown. It has been left to recuperate after numerous harvests to get the pH level right and the nutrients back into the earth. It is ground that has no seed. So to break up the fallow ground means to prepare your hearts to receive the seed. The seed being the pure word of God. And so in order to repent, God says to the nation of Israel, prepare your hearts to receive the the seed to receive the word of God. He says, do not sow among thorns. Make sure that your heart is clear of, cut, of clutter. The context is here. Get rid of the abominations. Get rid of the false gods. Get rid of everything that is a distraction that you can be a pure vessel. Your heart is as pure soil ready to receive the pure word of God. If the field is, has thorns and thistles and weeds in, it's not going to bear crop. The parable of the sower is going to be speaking about what? Soil. The soil of the heart. Now in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 11, I want us to just look at two Proverbs that speak about soil. Proverbs 12, verse 11. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, 
or he who cultivates or works the land will be satisfied with bread. But he who follows frivolity, worthless things, is devoid of understanding. He who tills his land, he who cultivates his land, who prepares his land, he who sows into his land, will be satisfied with bread. He who follows frivolity is devoid of understanding. Now this has both a natural and a spiritual connotation. A farmer that does not look after his land, does not cultivate his land, is going to starve to death. Would you agree? And he f follows frivolity, meaninglessness, is devoid of understanding. So the natural application is very easy to understand. If the farmer does not look after his land and, and till his land and put good soil in his land and care for the seedlings, he's going to starve. If he's busy with all things that are unimportant and frivolous, he's an idiot. He's void of understanding. He's a fool. But so true is the, the spiritual understanding of this. He who tools his heart, he or she who prepares his heart for the word of God, who makes sure that there's no weeds and clutter, will have bread, will be satisfied with bread. Who is the bread? Jesus is the bread of life. And he who follows frivol frivolty, vain things, lacks understanding. In the 13th chapter of Proverbs, reading from verse 23, much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. The field of a poor man has the potential of bearing much food if it is cultivated. The potential for food is there if cultivated. Much food, or well, the potential for much food, is in the fallow ground of the poor. And for lack of justice, there is waste. Or for lack of justice, it is swept away. Okay, what's that got to do with anything? Well, the Jews understood that the ground must be cultivated. The ground must be sown. There's potential for much bread when the soil is prepared. Now, God equates the physical often with the spiritual. He uses the physical, the natural, to describe kingdom principles we do not sow amongst thorns and we break up the fallow ground we prepare it to receive seed this is this is used in jeremiah in context with repentance and coming back to god in proverbs if you want to have much bread and much food Make sure the heart is cultivated. That's a bit of background. So we go back to Mac, uh, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 3. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and they were scorched, and, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So we all understood that. And the disciples came to him in verse 10 and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, 
and shall not understand. And seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. That sounds a bit unfair of the Lord. He shares this vital parable, and nobody understands him. And when the disciples say, Lord, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus says, so they can't understand. But that you can understand. But they couldn't. And they didn't. But they asked the Lord at least to explain. The rest of the people went away ignorant, willfully. They did not want to know what the parable meant. The disciples had no clue what Jesus had just said, just like the rest of the crowds. Both the disciples and the crowds were completely ignorant and oblivious to what Jesus was teaching. But the difference between the disciples and the crowds was that the disciples came to Jesus and said, please explain to us. We want to know. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He who wants to hear what God has to say will hear what God has to say. He who wants understanding will get understanding. He who wants to be ignorant will remain ignorant. It is key to understand that the parable of the sower is about the individual's personal response to the Word of God. Do you understand that? God cannot force you to obey His Word. The Word of God is sown. It was sown by Jesus, it was sown by the apostles, and through the ages it has been sown by godly individuals. And throughout the ages, as it was in the time of Jesus, as it was in the time of the apostles, and throughout the church age, there's always been four responses to the Word of God. There'll be those whose hearts are as stony ground, and immediately... The word is snatched away. Is it the sower's fault that the word gets snatched away? Or the hearer's? It's the hearer's. Why? Because if we break open our hearts, if we break open the fallow ground, if our hearts are ready to receive God's word, it will find fertile soil. The word will find fertile soil. The word will be germinated by the living waters of the Holy Spirit, and it will bear fruit. It's never the sower's fault. Now, many ministers get so frustrated, they begin to question whether they're called of God or not because there are so many that they minister to who never grasp the Word of God, and naturally, they blame themselves. Now, if they are not dissecting the Word of God accurately, yes, then it's their fault, but most ministers do not seek to deceive. The issue is not with the sower. The issue is always with the ground. It's always the soil in the hearts of men. So Jesus goes on to explain the parable in verse 18. He says, Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. If you don't understand the word of God and you don't ask for instruction, the enemy comes and snatches it. Remember, the disciples did not understand the word. But because they knew they didn't understand it and they had a desire to understand it, they asked the Lord, please explain. And as the Lord opens up the parable so they have understanding and so the seed can begin to germinate. But when we hear and have no desire to understand, then Satan takes that word and it is lost forever. And hopefully you get to hear it again. But that is taken from you. 
Whose fault is that? The sower or the hearer? Right. If we don't understand something and we have a heart after God, the natural response is, can you please explain that? None of us have all knowledge. All of us are forever learning. I'm grateful I fall into the category of ever learning. I know some people who are absolutely convinced that they know all things. And they've known all things for many years. They have not learned anything, certainly in the last decade. Can you imagine how self-deluded they are? So we're always learning, always, Lord, help me to understand. Lord, teach me that which I do not know. Verse 20, the second group. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. With joy. Now, joy is not his wife who he heard the word with. Joy is an emotion. He received the word with, with joy, with happiness, emotion, excitement, a bit of hype, maybe some colored lights, and somebody on the piano in a darkened church, because black we know is this definitely the color of God. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. When we receive the word of God with our emotions, and it is not received in the spirit, in the heart of man, we get all excited about that word. But when trials and tribulations come, immediately we are shaken. Why? Why? because our joy is taken from us. When we serve God via our emotions, as soon as there's opposition, as soon as there is, is an attack of the enemy or something comes against us, we lose our joy because our joy is not rooted in Christ. It's rooted in what we've heard. But if what we've heard is not in Christ, rooted in Christ, cemented in our hearts and it's just a nice feeling in our heads as soon as it's challenged God doesn't love me this stuff doesn't work I don't want to be a Christian anymore the Bible's a lie my pastor is wrong and what happens? they stumble saints the Word of God is not meant to be stored in the emotions. It needs to be rooted in the heart, deposited deep within our spirit, meditated upon in our soul. We bring the Word to our soul and meditate on it, but it's first in the spirit, rooted in the spirit. Verse 22, the third group. Now he received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 3. Break up the fallow ground. Do not sow amongst thorns. What are thorns, saints? It's the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Your mother and your brothers are here. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? But he who does the will of God. In the modern church age, my mother's here. Great. Home church canceled. Not coming to church. I'm going to go visit family. Everything is important but the kingdom. Any excuse not to be amongst the brethren. The cares of this life. I need to quickly work on this project, you know. I've got seven days a week. I do nothing for six of them, but I've got an assignment 
for my college course, I better do it on a Sunday morning. Because Monday through Friday is my latest episode of Skopskit and Donna from Netflix. And of course, Saturday shopping, chilling, watching Supersport and Arts Wimbledon. Strawberries and cream and tennis balls. And of course, Sunday is a bride with the family. So the only free time I've got, of course, is Sunday morning because God understands how busy I am. So many important things I have. Could you imagine missing days of my life, which has been going on, what, for 190 years? <laughs> the deceitfulness of riches. You know, no billionaire on his deathbed ever murmured his last words, I should have gone for that extra million dollars. Nobody on their deathbed said, I should have closed that deal. The pursuit of riches and the cares of this life is a folly. Keeping your place in Matthew chapter 13, for those of you who are brave enough, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 3. This is the chief of parables, saints, the words of Jesus, not the words of a man, the words of our Lord. Paul writing says in verse 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which comes envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Anybody who teaches, who believes that godliness is a means of gain, financial gain, you are to withdraw yourself from. So if a church teaches that coming to Jesus guarantees you financial prosperity, the words of Scripture teach by their books. No, withdraw from such. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Those who desire to be rich, those who desire, they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some having strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The cares of this life, said Jesus, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. The number of Christians that I have known who have pursued riches and have become undone is vast. I have never met anybody who has believed that God wants them rich, who has stayed the course. Every single one of them without fail went into error. Most of them, I know, landed up in poverty. Now there is the, there is the office of the giver. There are those whom God will prosper because their hearts are right. They love the Lord first, Him first, they are givers when they had nothing. They were givers when they had something. And because they've been faithful, because it is a character trait of them, 
They have been blessed by God and they give abundantly to the work of God. There is the office of the giver. But very few Christians are called to that because most of us have to deal with covetousness. We hold on to what is ours. What's mine is mine and what, what's yours is mine as well. The lust of this life. Now, saints, we have to work. We need to deal with the cares of this life. But we are not to be overcome by the cares of this life. We live in this world, but we are not of this world. We live by a higher standard. When you are so overwhelmed by the things of this life that the things of the kingdom suffer, you are in error you have been deceived and how often is it that we can't pray we can't spend time with believers we can't attend church because there's something pressing of this world there's something in our business there's something at work there's something that i need to do for school there's something pressing and you know what happens the word is choked you never, ever, ever get to experience the fullness of a relationship with the Lord because you have made a stand. There are other things more important than God. This is the chief of parables. Jesus is going to illuminate on this point when he speaks about the man who finds a treasure in a field that treasures the kingdom. And that treasure in the field is so valuable to him that he sells everything he has that he may obtain it. Nothing compares to, in his world to the kingdom. Everything he counts as rubbish that he may gain the kingdom. In such a man, in such a woman, the word can never be choked. The merchant who finds a pearl of great price and desires it more than anything else. These are the other parables. When the kingdom of God and the lordship of Jesus Christ means more to you than anything else in life, you will be fruitful. But if the things of this world are more important to you, now we can, we can play lip service, we can all say in fancy words, most of us, we've been Christians for a year or two, learn Christianese. We learn all the cliches. Jesus, Lord of my life, I'm not of this world, I'm above and not. You know, we, we roll out these cliches, but our lives speak a different story. Our lives tell a different story. What we are, what we place value on, tells others what's important to us. The words of Jesus, not mine. These are the sad realities, but there is a fourth group. Thank God there's a fourth group. Verse 23, but he who received the word on the good ground. That is the ground that has been tilled. It is the fellow ground that has been broken up. It is the heart that cries out, God, I repent. I want your lordship. I want to live for you. Your kingdom come. Lord, your will be done, not only on earth, but in my life. Lord, purify me. Search me and see if there be any wicked thing in me. Lord, remove the stones, remove the thorns, remove any alien seed, remove anything from me that might choke the word, that might quench the word, that might damage the seed. That's good ground. It's not the perfect person. It's the person who is desperate for God. It's the person who sees the value of the kingdom. It's like the man who sees the treasure in the field. He sees the value. 
that this kingdom of God, the salvation through Jesus Christ, this adoption by the Spirit of the living God, this eternity that awaits is more precious to me than all the riches of this world. To such a one, to such a person is accounted to have good soil. It's an attitude, saints. That's all it is. It's not one better than the other. God prefers one person above another. The sower sows the seed to all. The sower has no control over the ground. It is the hearer that is Lord over his heart. But to him who hears who receives seed on the ground on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it not to understand with head knowledge but to understand with every fiber of your being to know that you know that what you're hearing is truth to he who hears and understands who indeed bears fruit and produces some 30 fold 60, sorry, 130 and 60 fold. When the Lord and His kingdom and His word is everything to you, you cannot but be fruitful. You hear that? When Jesus and His word and His kingdom is everything to you, you can't help but being fruitful. You will bear fruit, and the worst of it, you will bear 30 fold. Isn't that amazing? Because the Word of God is living. It is powerful. It changes the hearer, and the hearer in turn through the Word changes others who will hear. But we must break up the fellow ground. We must choose not to sow amongst thorns. We must circumcise our hearts or allow God by His Spirit to circumcise our hearts. Saints, fruitfulness has got nothing to do with anyone else except each of us individually. On this truth is built all the teaching of Scripture. If Jesus Christ the greatest gift that has ever been given man, the treasure without price. If he's not Lord of all your life, you are unfruitful and barren. Unless he has been given lordship and permission to rule and reign, the word of God will be choked in your life. It'll profit you nothing. But if he truly is Lord, you will not be unfruitful it's up to you and I to determine what sort of soil we have in our hearts and I conclude with Colossians chapter 1 which is not entirely true. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. God expects us to be fruitful. If we are in Him and the Word of God has been sown in our hearts, the Lord expects a harvest. How many keen gardeners are there amongst us? For those precious folk, when you sow seeds in your garden, on your pot plants, after going out 
and firstly making sure there's no stones in the soil, making sure that there's fertilizer and you prepare the soil and you sow the seed. Do you have an expectation that something sprouts? You do. And isn't it precious when that little seedling sprouts and pushes through the soil? Well, God also has an expectancy that when His Word has been sown into our hearts, God has an expectancy that something will grow and what grows will be fruitful for His kingdom. And it is for this reason that Jesus says in John chapter 15 that those branches that bear fruit, the Lord prunes that they may be more fruitful. We looked at this last week and the week before. And the eighth verse of John 15, Jesus said, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. So discipleship is linked to fruitfulness. But we can't be fruitful unless our, the soil of our hearts is right. And the soil of our heart can't be right until we have asked God to cleanse it. To make sure that there's nothing else in the soil that's going to hinder the seed. But do you see that fruitfulness and discipleship is connected? A disciple is fruitful. Not because they're trying to do works, but because the Word of God in them will produce the fruit. Being sold out to Jesus makes you fruitful. Being bogged down with the cares of this life chokes the seed and you become unfruitful. So saints, what is the response? Till the soil. If indeed you wish to have a seed planted. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, Pierre's 100% right. Make sure the soil's right. If indeed you see value in the kingdom. For many of us, we need to return to our first love. How do we t return to our first love? By considering the value of Jesus. The value we place on the Lord and His kingdom will determine the value or the effort we put into making sure our hearts are right before the Lord. Saints, this is meant to be an encouragement. I know when I speak it comes out as a conviction. But it's meant to be an encouragement. It is up to us. Every one of us can be fruitful for Jesus doesn't matter who you are. If you put him first and you love him with all your heart and you do not seek the riches of this life, you're not driven by this world, but by, you're driven by the Lord, you will be fruitful. Now, I'm not saying that we don't work and do our very best in our jobs, in our businesses, in our careers, in our studies. Of course we do. Of course we do. But Christ must be Lord of all. And then we'll be fruitful. Saints, this is the first parable Jesus ever taught. It is the most important parable that Jesus ever taught. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? All who do the will of my Father. All who love me and obey. I think it's time for some of us maybe just to ask God to forgive us for where we've been and I walk with the Lord.